At times in my life, I've wondered hard. After death, is there life? Is there anything? If there's a God, what's God like? Will God intervene in human affairs? The claims of religion are matters of ultimate concern. So I target the most extravagant of those claims. The Judeo-Christian scriptures tell of a new heaven and a new earth, when all, supposedly, shall be made new. When the first heaven and the first earth shall be passed away, when former things shall not be remembered. What could this mean? How could this ever happen? Believers say it's God's mystery. They should offer more. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to see if they can. I begin at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, with philosopher and ordained minister, Nancy Murphy. Nancy is a leader in the Christian movement to replace belief in an immortal soul, which after death traditionally goes someplace good or someplace bad, with belief in a robust, embodied resurrection of the dead. Nancy, what? can you tell us, as a Christian theist, you would imagine to be the new heavens and the new earth? Whereas many people understand heaven as a place or a realm or a dimension that only humans go to, I'm convinced that God's plan is a transformation of the entire cosmos, the entire universe. And that's partly because we just can't make sense of a place for us to go apart from the universe, and we also speculate that the universe as we know it isn't going to last forever, whereas our life with God is, in fact, supposed to last forever. I also believe that God loves the, the rest of creation as well as ourselves, and that God would not allow all of those beautiful animal and plant creations to go to nothing. So I believe that the whole cosmos is going to be transformed and transformed into some other kind of stuff. The term stuff, very vague, because we simply can't project anything from what we know about physicality in this cosmos to physicality in the next. All we know is that we will be embodied in order to relate to one another and there will be an environment for us to be in, but we know that the decay, the suffering, the disorder that go along with being embodied in this world, we know that all of that will be changed. Do we see the vast majority or arguably everyone who has ever lived to be part of that world? Tough question, and I think we haven't adequate grounds to answer that. On the one hand, there's the argument that God genuinely respects our freedom to reject Him. But on the other hand, there's the argument that God loves all of us and will never give up on any of us. And there's simply no way to distinguish between those two. But if you look at any religious tradition, the fact is that the great majority of the world are not part of that tradition. So in the Christian tradition, the majority of the world has not rejected the Christian God because they've never really had opportunity to know that God. I think what's important is whether you're rejecting that for which Jesus stands. There are so many similarities in all of the major religions. What religion does not teach loving your neighbor? What religion does not teach helping the helpless? So people in other religions who didn't even know the name Jesus or nothing about the Christian Bible, who lived according to some of those same precepts, may in fact be in the, the good group. That's right. And we have this notion that when we die or when we're raised up, we will encounter God and know God as God really is. And 
those people will say, ah, this is what I have been attracted to all my life, and now I see it or him in its fullness. You know, hallelujah, I want to be here. You mentioned the rest of the universe. You've mentioned animals. Uh, are we talking about every animal from all time? I mean, you got a lot of insects. <laughs> Cockroaches. <laughs> Saint cockroach. <laughs> they all come, are they all coming back? Because I'm not sure I want to be there if they all are. <laughs> well, they won't bite anymore. <laughs> How about my pet poodle? Who... Absolutely. And if I'm right, we'll continue this conversation for centuries the next life. I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> to Nancy, a new heaven and a new earth is a literal transformation of the entire universe while sort of preserving almost all the entities in the universe. Part of me says, that's absurd. Human delusion driven by fear of death. But another part whispers, I hope I'm wrong. What's the origin of this wild and weird vision? Granted, a new heaven and a new earth is often quoted by Christians. But the phrase first appears in the Hebrew Bible. So off I go to Yeshiva University in New York to visit a professor of Jewish philosophy, Rabbi Arthur Hyman. Arthur is an expert on Jewish eschatology, the study of final events in world history and humanity's ultimate destiny. Arthur, in Judaism and Christianity, we have this concept of a new heaven and new earth. Where does that come from? Well, it goes back to a verse in, in Isaiah. Now, uh, Jewish tradition is not too specific on what exactly this kind of cosmic revolution would be. The basic idea is not so much that there be a new heaven as that I believe it describes a state of human beings here on earth. And here we have to understand that for traditional Judaism, there is a kind of a resolution of human difficulties in, in the afterlife or the world to come, olam haba as it's called in Hebrew. And I think the basic idea is that the kind of difficulties that we find in the present life, uh, certainly death and sickness and so on, will no longer exist. Because if life would continue, what need would there be for an, for an afterlife? Because the whole idea of the afterlife is that it will be a better state in the here and now, and that people who have been resurrected, which is part of that belief, will be rewarded by leading a good life and not having the difficulties that they have in, in this life. But the world to come is physically on this earth, is that right? It's physically on, on this earth. And this earth is still the same kind of physical earth? Or is the, when you talk about a new heaven, a new earth, is, is there some kind no, of No, no, I think that has to be understood, at least in the prophet, more metaphorically. Uh, I do not think that Jewish tradition expects a new creation of the world where there be no earth and there be no planets uh, or there be many earth or any of these sorts of things. This is not part of, of Jewish belief. It would be a, a description of an ideal state. And this is the main point of Jewish eschatology, that life is not the end. That, that's the crucial point, that what we do in this life will make a difference in the sense that it will be carried over. If we do the right thing, we will inherit the world to come and we will lead the kind of idealized life that we do not lead now. And this will go on, go on forever. Go on forever. Go on forever, yes. Going on forever, but still very physical? That may be an idealized view, but it sure sounds contradictory to me. Physical things do not go on forever. Impermanence is their essence. When I push most theologians about a new heaven and a new earth, they tell me not to worry. Well, sorry, I do worry. The totality of religion either makes sense or it doesn't. If a new heaven and a new earth must remain a complete mystery, 
Then, as for me, I'd not give it much airtime. I need at least some ways it could work. So I go on search for theologians trained in physics. I find Robin Collins, a physics-educated philosophy professor and a committed Christian. Robin has been bringing new thinking to old ideas. Robin, the New Testament talks about the new heavens and the new earth. What does that mean to you? Um, there's going to be discontinuity and continuity with this world. The creation itself will be transformed, undergo a sort of metamorphosis. And so we'll be partakers of that new creation. So let me give an example of how that might be compatible with, let's say, modern understandings of the universe. If we were to examine a caterpillar and did not know it, a butterfly could come from it. We wouldn't see any butterfly in there. We would just extrapolate. It's going to be continue a caterpillar life. L lo and behold, there's like an implicate order, a hidden order in the caterpillar that we still don't fully understand of information that gets activated somehow and it becomes a butterfly. Likewise, as an example of the universe, if we were standing at the Big Bang, all we would see is this uniform energy and maybe a little bit of matter, we would never guess that there would be these planets, these structure forming, and then on one of these places at least, planet Earth, this evolution of life occurring. So likewise, I think the creation has this implicate structure and that somehow we have a part with God of transforming at some point in the future that the whole creation will be transformed and as it says in the New Testament, it will, we, it will be partakers of the children of God, so that um, the creation itself will be a partaker of the divine nature. Do you think that this, this transformation of the creation, this new heavens and the new earth, is some gradual incremental process, uh, or is this a, an instant spike function, step function event where God intervenes and suddenly we have a new heaven and a new earth? There's some gradualness to it, but I think at some point there's going to have to be a metamorphosis itself implies a very, at least a very rapid change. It's a, 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 a belief I'm toying with that gives the universe itself a purpose and our place in the universe a purpose. So your argument would be that there is something special in the way the universe is structured yes. to enable this transformation to occur? A, a more subtle level than we've even discovered at this point that enables it to occur. Now, maybe it would need divine help, but it just simply wouldn't be simply a supernatural act. It would also be tie into some structure in the universe itself. And that we, in the salvation process, right. according to your theology, would spend our eternity in that transformed we universe. would be connected to that universe in eternity. And this would be a bodily resurrection or? Right, it would be a transformed body too. Another idea I'm exploring is that the body itself is transformed or resurrected at the same time as the transformation of the universe. I'm intrigued by Robin's speculations something about the implicate structure of the current heaven and earth, which can be transformed to be partakers of the divine nature in a new heaven and a new earth. But can such transformation be even remotely permissible under the laws of physics? Before I utter a reflex no and a hearty laugh, I should go to Cambridge, England, to speak with a distinguished quantum physicist turned Anglican priest, John Polkinghorne. Can modern physics offer any insights into cosmic transformation? John is unafraid to assert that eschatology, the study of ultimate matters, is an essential part of Christianity. Every story that science tells ends in death. For you and me, it'll end in death. For the universe itself, over many, many billions of years, it'll eventually end in futility, probably in just ever increasing cold and dilution. And that raises a serious question. What if the world is a creation? What's God up to if it all ends in futility? 
Science's horizontal story is not the only story to tell. There is a vertical story that theology tells of God's faithfulness. And so if there is a, a destiny beyond death, if there is a true meaningfulness to the universe, then that requires looking in that, in that theological direction. One has to ask the question, can you make a credible understanding of a destiny beyond death for human beings? And when you begin to think about that, you see it's going to involve two different requirements. One is continuity. I mean, it really must be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who live again in the kingdom of heaven, not new characters given the old names for old times' sake. So there must be continuity, but equally, of course, there must be discontinuity, in the sense there's not much point in making Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alive again if they're going to die again. So you have to have both continuity and discontinuity. The Christian hope has always been death and resurrection, the Jewish hope also, of course. So I have to be re-embodied, because it's, that's what I am as, as a human being, if I'm truly to live again. That's the continuity side of things. The discontinuity side of things is that uh, I, I'm not made alive again in order to die again. So though I'm going to be embodied, I'm going to, I must be embodied in some new form of matter. And I believe it's perfectly coherent to believe that God can bring into being such a new form of matter. You see, why do we die in this world? Why is this a world of transience and decay? The answer essentially is the second law of thermodynamics. And the, it says that Disorder always, in the end, wins over order. And it wins simply because there are many, many ways of being disorderly and very few ways of being orderly. So, but I think it's perfectly coherent to believe that God could bring into being a new form of matter with such self-organizing principles that drift to futility would no longer be present. And where would that matter come from? I believe it would come from the redemption of the matter of this world, that when the universe dies, in futility, God will redeem it and produce a new creation to replace the old creation. It's not a second creation um, out of nothing, as a second go to try and do it better the second time, so to speak, but it's a creation out of the old. And what will that ultimate universe be like? I think there will be some, some other forms of continuity that carry over. For example, I think it's intrinsic to human beings, not only that we're embodied, but we're also temporal beings. So I think the life of the world to come will be a temporal life. It won't be a moment of timeless illumination. It will be an unfolding process. Fulfillment is going to be drawing closer and closer to the unveiled reality of, of the divine presence. And would that involve the entirety of the universe? In appropriate ways, I believe, yes. I think that God has a destiny for the whole of creation. Human beings will, will have a destiny as self-conscious, God-conscious human beings, sticks and stones will have, obviously have a somewhat, somewhat diff different destiny. And in this vision, we will really feel to be ourselves. We will, we will we'll fully, have... fully fulfill what, 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 what it is within us to be. And that will be an unfolding process. It will be an exploratory process and a creative process within ourselves. Yes, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a mysterious vision, an exciting vision, a vision of very great hope. John looks to a new form of matter, which God, he says, can bring into being. New matter, which is not subject to decay because it is not subject to becoming disorderly. New matter, which is redeemed out of the ordinary matter of this world. An extraordinary claim, which I would be inclined to dismiss if it were not made by John. Now, all visions of a new heaven and a new earth call upon the concept of eternity. Eternity. What does this mean? Forever? What does that mean? If a new heaven and a new earth is to make any sense, there must be a deeper understanding of time. So I turned to the founder of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences in Berkeley, Robert John Russell, an ordained minister with a doctorate in physics. Bob seeks intersection between the revelations of the Bible and the laws of nature. Bob, as a scientist, can we make some progress in defining eternity, imagining eternity, understanding what the nature of time is in eternity? Well, I think we can. Um, if eternity, or the new creation, as I prefer to say, is the goodness, the fullness, the best possible experience that has some correlates with what we have now, 
then our experiences now are a clue to that. And one of the base, basic elements of being human is time, being in time, having a past, having a future, hopes, memories, being in the real present, the taste of the present. Somehow temporality, that, that flowing time, has got to be a part of eternity. So it isn't a kind of freeze of the angels, but it's an even more abundant set of experiences and temporality of pasts and futures. Same time, one of the tragedies of life is the past is past. You know, mom died three years ago, I'll never see her again. It's done. And the future is not known. I may be in a plane crash today. In that sense, you don't want that kind of temporality in eternity. You want the fullness of being temporal without the cost. Every moment, every present moment, like right now, does have a past that's gone and a future that isn't. But there will be a future moment, which is future, which when it's present will have its own reality and past that's gone and future. Now, if you take each of those as a separate story and add them all up, you get a much richer sense of time. It's like a book. You read a book page by page. Every page you read, you remember the past, but you don't read it again. You don't know the future yet. Supposing you had an infinite set of books, one book for every present moment. Every present moment has its past, it's gone, future not yet. But supposing you could lay them all up in front of you and glance back and forth at them and be able to read them all at once. The book from yesterday, the book from tomorrow, the book in the future, all those present to you. But the idea is to say there is a way in which you can preserve the good part of temporality, the sense of past, present, future, without the tragic part that past is necessarily gone. Because in this wonderful library of books, they're all there. They retain their distinctiveness. I call it co-presence. They're all, all the presents, the, the present moments with their past and futures are all available. I think what's great about the Judeo-Christian tradition, it really emphasizes life, community, covenant, action, love, agency, right? Full embodiment. They all honor time. So somehow, if God is to be trusted, that, the, that God will bring together a new kind of being for us in which will be temporal without those tragic losses and those tragic threats that mar this world. Does that mean the sense of present in an eternal life will be a, 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 a bigger sense of present in some way? Very much so. Our, our own sense of presence has memory in the present. I am now remembering the past. Yes. And it has anticipation of the future. I am now anticipating the future. So my own sense of time is sort of thick. It is, I don't experience time as a moment. I experience it as a kind of huge uh, extended continuum. But in physics, we don't. We say physics is, represents time as a point uh, on, a, on a line that moves. My hope is that the experience we have of time as duration or thickness actually is representative of the way nature is too. In fact, if nature is to be transformed into the new creation, it might already be much richer, much more temporal, much thicker, much having more surfaces, if you like. <laughs> What you're saying, in the current structure of reality, yes. there are those elements that will later blossom forth in some way? or Yeah. It's hard to see how if, if current reality is really point-like, but our experience is thickness, that it's hard to see how we as psychosomatic unities, as a person, as an embodied person, could be both something transformable into this future eschaton, but yet nature just be this sense of time as a point-like present. And, and so th uh, my hope is that if the eschatological or new creation ideas make any sense about eternity being co-present and thick, thickness in time, that that actually says we're missing something now about the way the world already is. The model I'm using for whatever it's worth is the model of the resurrection of Jesus, which is transformation. Both continuity, he's still Jesus, he isn't Sally, and discontinuity, he doesn't just eat and die, he lives forever. I'm saying if that's a clue for the whole universe, not just this one person, if that's our future, then there's got to be elements of continuity as well as discontinuity. And at the end of the day, uh, eternity sounds pretty good? Better. <laughs> We're going to be there forever. <laughs> I hope Bob's right, of course. Who wouldn't? But I'm still fixated on how such cosmic transformation could actually happen. Because if religion's climax collapses, then religion's whole structure tumbles down. Religion cannot hide from its ultimate claims. A new heaven and a new earth is meant to be real, not ancient myth or poetic metaphor. Science says all reality is only physical, 
The universe is pointless, and when human beings are dead, they are dead forever. I am not a fan of false and phony purpose. Pretending that in a purely physical world, meaning can persist or good can endure. Personally, I'd love a new heaven and a new earth. I like the continuity of individual identity, along with, of course, the discontinuity of eternal life. I do have hope, but I do not have faith. I yearn to be closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.